Now here's something unexpected. While the entire world was sitting around waiting for Iran to attack Israel, Ukraine decided that it was time to flip the script and invade Russia. And that leaves us to wonder just how effective this invasion force has been. What is Ukraine's underlying strategy? And how will Russia respond? And to preview the answers, 135 square kilometers, newsworthy chaos, and a lot more troops. Yep, today is going to be a fun one. First though, as a word of warning, I am producing this as everything is happening. So take what I say from here on in with a grain of salt. Ukraine is a big country, of course, but we head to its northern border and across from the Russian Kursk Oblast. On the morning of August 6th, Ukraine sent hundreds of soldiers, or perhaps up to a couple of thousand of soldiers, across that border for, um, reasons. Now, attacks on Russian territory have become commonplace over the last eight months, but this one was different. For the most part, Ukraine's usual strategy has been to fly drones to Russian oil refineries, where they explode and wreak economic havoc. But this attack put actual boots on the ground. And it was not like the Belgorod incursion from May 2023, when Kyiv let Russian dissidents use Ukrainian soil as a staging ground for their own invasion. No, by all reports, these are actual Ukrainian soldiers, though Kyiv has remained tight-lipped about what exactly its official role is there. Meanwhile, in Moscow, Putin's inner circle met to discuss the ongoing assault. The public reports were optimistic. 315 Ukrainian casualties, lots of equipment destroyed, the enemy halted, and a promise that eventually they would be pushed back, even while awkwardly juxtaposed with evacuation orders. Accordingly, the maps indicate that reversing the attack without a voluntary Ukrainian retreat will not be easy. This is the international border, and this is a projection of where Ukrainian troops have reached, again with the caveat that we do not really know what is going on here yet. That is a lot of territory in a very short period of time. Overlaying the actual border, and adding in a scale for 5 kilometers, all of this territory winds up being roughly 135 square kilometers. And this may be conservative, because other status reports show further Ukrainian gains on either side. By comparison, the past three months have been the most productive period of Russia's current offensive, and they have accumulated 201 square kilometers in May, 50 square kilometers in June, and 177 square kilometers in July. Thus, a 48-hour period has given Ukraine roughly the equivalent of an average month of progress for Russia. Now, that is a shocking headline, which makes you wonder what the heck is going on here. But if you look closely, the whole shocking headline might be the entire point of what Ukraine is attempting to do. First though, from a military standpoint, what Ukraine has accomplished is roughly analogous to the Kharkiv incursion that Russia began a few months ago. Basically, this has always been on the table for Kyiv, if Kyiv wanted it. You see, in the middle of a war, armies tend not to build defensive fortifications directly on top of existing international borders. The reason being that it is easy to target a would-be construction crew from the safety of your own positions. Thus, the defensive fortifications tend to be built a bit further back. In the case of the Kursk region, Russia instead chose to set the defensive perimeter here, which notably means that Ukraine is challenging it in multiple places, if these reports are to be believed. As a result, many settlements were left undefended. Ukraine was welcome to enter, but doing so would eventually expose those invading soldiers to enemy fire. The tension of such an operation is that the defenders deliberately leave the fortifications understaffed. Manpower is always at a premium, and Russia would rather deploy those warm bodies to where the action is perennially hot. In turn, the onus falls on Russian logistics to pull together an emergency response before things get too out of hand. To continue with the comparison, with the roles reversed in Kharkiv, Ukraine basically succeeded in its defensive response. 
Russia still occupies much of the land, yes. But Ukraine halted and then partially pushed back the offensive. Put differently, the Kremlin traded a whole bunch of human lives to move the lines on maps. Notably, as we discussed recently, at a rate that is unsustainable if held constant. Now, what Ukraine has in store for Kursk is a good question. And all of that discussion regarding Kharkiv serves as a warning to Western observers to not get too excited with what has happened so far. It is hard to believe that Kyiv will want its troops to stay. Unlike the Kremlin, Ukraine does not have any desire to annex the region it currently finds itself in. Moreover, doing so would be a practical impossibility. Hundreds of soldiers an occupation force does not make. Same goes even if it is 2,000. But there are both tangible and intangible benefits to the operation. Intangibly, it generates a good news cycle for Ukraine. It has been months of territorial losses for the country. Even if this is coming at Pyrrhic costs for Russia, it is still causing Ukrainian morale to sink. What's more, it appears that another city is about to fall. This time, it is New York. Uh, confusingly, there is a city named New York in Ukraine. It's that one, not this one. Fortunately, we are still pretty far away from the world reaching its series finale. Zooming out to the broader tactical operations, Russia's strength for the past two years has been to bombard Ukraine's defensive positions with artillery. Then, with Ukraine temporarily weakened, Russian meat waves push forward, taking those positions while suffering heavy losses. Now, Ukraine redeploying a few hundred more soldiers to the hot front would make it more difficult for Russia's meat waves to succeed. But the better question for military planners in Kyiv is whether that is the best marginal use of the resource. By conducting hit-and-run raids across the border, Ukraine prevents Russia from countering with the traditional meat wave strategy. They just are not sticking around long enough for Russia to find them. Back to the drawing board for the Kremlin. Meanwhile, Ukraine could just go back and forth until such operations are no longer profitable. Consequently, the question then turns to how Russia will counter them. Obviously, the public line is that this is a major escalation in the war. But what the Kremlin can do about it is another story. The United States is not involved, so rhetoric about that will not get very far. Indeed, National Security Council Coordinator John Kirby more or less shrugged when asked about it. U.S. policy is that aid cannot go toward that purpose. But what is happening is Ukraine's thing, and, as such, Kirby would need to talk to Kyiv to ascertain the strategy. Now, practically speaking, Russia has two options to deal with the problem. The first is to aggressively push out a sanitary zone. Effectively, that means replicating the 2024 Kharkiv offensive all along the northern border, as that was the same underlying public motivation. But doing that would require a ton of men, likely way more than what Russia can muster. Indeed, the Kremlin remains on a voluntary recruitment system, and it has been spiking the financial offers just to meet recruitment goals. For Ukraine, there is some risk that the Kursk raid will inflame the Russian public. Certainly, the Kremlin's release discussed earlier is framing things in that way. But Russia struggles to recruit within the western portion of the country, and those outside are more interested in the monetary aspects of this than signing up out of patriotism. What can I say? Money talks. Of course, that does not mean that political persuasion campaigns are not helpful even when directed toward the western portion of the country. After all, it is the wealthier sectors of Russia that are ultimately footing the majority of the bill for the war, so keeping them in your corner would be a good idea. The flip side is that failing to defend one's own borders is a bit of an embarrassment. As such, overall, this does not seem to be a net political win for the Kremlin. Meanwhile, the other option is to redeploy internal security forces to the border. This is easier to do because of a Russian legal trick. Before and throughout the war, Russia had, and then later maintained, 
a standard year-long conscription program. The one slight detail is that those soldiers can only be used on Russian territory. This is part of the reason that Russia formally annexed the four Ukrainian oblasts being fought over in the east, even if virtually no one else on the world stage recognized it. However, in the intervening period, we have encountered another complication. The messy thing known as politics popped up once again. Remember, the Kremlin has moved away from using legal coercion to build its army, so as to avoid angering the masses, or perhaps just to avoid scaring away the rich folks, thereby preserving what is left of the economy. Either way, the remedy for all of this is to use a system of voluntary contracts. Nevertheless, the fact that this is Russian territory by everyone's understanding means that there are a bunch of conscripted soldiers that could be put to work there. Still, this is not free for the Kremlin. The more soldiers that are stationed on the border with Ukraine, the fewer there can be across the rest of the country. So, if some type of uprising were to occur, as though that would ever happen, there would be fewer readily available resources for the Kremlin to call upon. But that may be a problem for future Putin to worry about when present Putin needs to stop Ukraine from continuing this. Meanwhile, present you can treat future you by ordering one of my books on the war. You'll learn a lot. Check the video description for more information about them. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.